All God's people feel like they're a stranger in this world, don't feel like this is where you belong, say amen. Amen, amen. absolutely. So thank you, praise team, and Eric for honoring the graduates and all you graduates. Uh, well done. Good job. Hey, I also want to just, before I get started here, just thank everyone who uh, was out there Tuesday night helping with the church sign out there by Neil Tyree. Did you all see that? Pretty cool. So yeah, thank you all who, who came out and helped and who came out and just encouraged us as we worked and sweated. So I know I sweated. So yeah, we have some encouragers here. So that's awesome. So yeah. Uh, so it was a good time. And, and so, but uh, yeah, we appreciate all your help. So hey, this morning's sermon title is The Church on Mission. Okay. The Church on Mission. And I named it that because we have seen in this sermon series that the church, that is the group of people, the group of believers that have come together in Jerusalem and now in other parts of the regions, they, they have went on a mission. And from the time that Barnabas and Paul went to Antioch in chapter 11, see we're going through this uh, chapter by chapter here, or, or going to try. From the time Paul and Barnabas went to Antioch in chapter 11, the church has been on mission. And that mission continues to this day. Because the Word of God and the Gospel of God needs to reach as many people as possible. And we, the church, are responsible to get the good news about Jesus Christ out to the world. That's our job. That's our mission. That's the reason the church exists. That's the reason Calvary Baptists exist. We are to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to the people in our community, to the people in our state, to the people in our nation, and to people around the world. Now, here's the thing. Not many of us have the opportunity to go to other countries and share the love of Christ, do we? I mean, we, we just don't have that opportunity. That's why we're part of the Southern Baptist Convention and the International Mission Board, which is the largest mission organization in the world. And maybe we can't just up and leave our homes here and travel around the country and go from state to state and, and spread the good news either. That's why we have the North American Mission Board, and we support them as well through the Southern Baptist convention. So we may not be able to travel the world or travel the country and spread the good news, but here's what we can do. We can reach out to the people right here in Pike County and Pittsfield, right? That we can do and should do and are called to do. The Great Commission in Matthew 28, where Jesus, we were told, you know, we are told by Jesus to go into the world and make disciples can be done right here in our own backyard, our own town. Because the church has always been on the mission. Always been on mission. Go into the world. Make disciples. Now, technically, the mission of the church began here at the beginning of chapter 13. You don't have to, to go there, but if you have your Bibles open to Acts 13, go to verse 2. We're going to back up from what Tina read. But it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And they went off. They took off. Barnabas and Paul began going into the regions of the Roman Empire and preached the gospel. And so the journey begins, right? Right here in verse 13, the journey begins. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidia and Antioch. On a Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down, and after reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue ruler sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. The author here of Acts, don't forget, the author of Acts is the same author of the Gospel of Luke. It's Dr. Luke. And we saw, like, like he did when we, we went through the sermon series in Luke, we see quite a bit of detail within this part of the chapter. Like Paul and Barnabas was set apart for the work of missions by the Holy Spirit. In verse 2 of chapter 13, we see that. And here in verse 13, they've been to Cyprus. And from there, they sailed to Perga and Pamphylia. And from there, they traveled to Pisidia and Antioch, which is a different place than the place they started out. That was Antioch of Syria. This is Pisidia and Antioch. So it's a different town. All this to say, the mission they're on is the beginning of what is known as Paul's first missionary journey. So if you've heard of Paul's missionary journeys, he had three that are in the Bible. This is his first one. This is the beginning of that. And they just started out. And they've covered a lot of territory. 
They meet new and interesting people along the way, all kinds of people from all different backgrounds with all many different beliefs. And we're going to see that as we go through Acts, all these different things that they, they face. And this is important for us to remember the fact as we reach out to today's culture, okay, where the people we're attempting to reach can and will be different than us, different in the way they live, different in the way they say things, uh, different in what they believe and the things that they do. So as we see here, the journey for Barnabas and Paul has begun, and that's the same mission that continues today in, in God's church with us. But let's back up in the text before we move forward, and let's not overlook that on this mission, Paul and Barnabas ha has hit the first snag, right? We've hit the first snag, basically, is what we see here. Right here in verse 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga, Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Here's that first Snag, and, and I said, Luke usually gives us a great amount of detail concerning what's happening here, but this point, at this case, he leaves out an important fact. And maybe at the time it didn't appear to be such a big deal to, to Luke, but it did turn into one. It says that John left them to return to Jerusalem. Now, this is not John the Apostle, this is John Mark, which we know in the Gospel of Mark, we know it's just Mark, so that's who this is. This is Mark, and he is left went back to Jerusalem. And we also know that Mark is a cousin of Barnabas, okay? So you got Paul, you have Barnabas, and his cousin Mark, and they head out on this missionary journey. So there's that close connection. And so when they get to sail, when they get to this one point and they're going to sail on to Perga, Mark left them and returned back home. Now, we don't know why he went back home. All we know that the, the account that Luke has here is that it's happened. He went, and he didn't sail with them. He went back to Jerusalem. He went back home. But what chapter 13 doesn't tell us, and what we find out a little bit later here, is when Mark left, Paul considered this, that he abandoned them, that he deserted them. And we know this from Acts 15, where Paul and Barnabas decide to go on another missionary journey, and they decide to go on another trip together, and Barnabas says, you know, let's, let's take Mark with us again. Paul says, no, he deserted us. He left us. And so it says in Acts 15 that they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. So Paul and Barnabas are no longer on their second missionary journey or working together, Okay. I'll be getting into this chapter here soon, but I'm not going to go into the disagreements within believers. But what I want to point out is setbacks and snags, right? Those things that, that get us caught and get us held up doesn't stop the mission. Setbacks and snags do not stop the mission. I use the word snag here because if you've ever been fishing, right, you cast your lure into the water, and, and people I fish with can testify I do this all the time. Cast the lure into the water, and I start reeling, it's like, oh, I'm snagged, right? You got caught on something, something that's under the water, something you can't see, something that's buried there, something that our line can get caught on, rocks, tree stumps, logs, old tires, buried docks, piers. And when you get your line hung up, you're snagged. Getting snagged doesn't only just happen in, happen in fishing. It happens in the Christian life. It happens in the Christian life, right? It can happen as we go on mission that God has given us to do. There are things that we will get snagged on that we can't see or see coming. It happened here with Paul and Barnabas. They were just, they were just gaining steam. The mission had been a success so far. People from outside of Jerusalem and, and surrounding regions was hearing about Jesus Christ and they were believing in him. And, and they were also seeing in mighty great works and wonders and, and the power of God. And then came, you know, out of nowhere. Mark says, I'm leaving. Just as things seem to be going their way and falling into place, Mark says, see you all later, I'm heading home. And I'm sure Paul was like, what do you mean you're going home? We just got started. 
We just got going. This is really good stuff we're doing. Why are you, why are you taking off? So here's the thing. Be prepared. Be prepared for setbacks in your Christian journey. Be prepared and ready for some discouragement to come your way. Look out for unexpected circumstances to just pop up out of nowhere. And just know that somewhere, somewhere down the line, someone will let you down when you rely on them the most. But also realize that setbacks, discouragement, unexpected circumstances, and, and people cannot stop or delay the mission that you are on. You have to keep going. You have to keep moving, just like Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul did here. And as we, and you personally take the mission seriously, all you have to do is begin with what you know. Begin with what you know. Verse 14. From Perga they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath they entered the synagogue and sat down. Now most of the time on their missionary journeys, Paul and Barnabas went straight to the people that they were most like, right? That is, they went to the Jewish people in the synagogues to tell people about Jesus. Even though they, they'd never been to this place before, and the synagogue was a familiar place for them. It's probably where they felt the most comfortable. This time throughout the uh, Roman Empire, the Jews had been scattered to regions outside of Judea, and from the exile in 586 B.C. until what we see here in, in Acts 13, Jewish people have been scattered around the, the regions. They went all over the place. And we see here that at Pisidian Antioch, they had a synagogue. And in any, any little town or, or village or city that had more than 10 Jewish men was able to have a synagogue in their, in their town. Going into the synagogue on the Sabbath was like home to Paul and Barnabas. It was, they were among friends. It's like Olive Garden. They treat you like family. And as we go on mission... Listen, Calvary, as we go on mission, right? We need to go to the people that we love, the people that's our family, the people that's our friends, right? Our coworkers, fellow students, acquaintances that you have contact with on a regular basis. Because the fact is, within those groups of people, within your family, your friends, your coworkers, your acquaintances, your, your fellow students, whoever it may be that you, you have contact with on a regular basis, within those groups of people, those, some of those people need Jesus. They need to hear about Jesus. They, they, and some of them don't know Jesus. And let me tell you, they need Jesus. And you begin the journey with them by telling them what you know. As we saw way back in our sermon series on evangelism, you can turn everyday conversations into gospel conversations. It's that simple. And you may think that the people that you know may not be interested in what you know about Jesus and how your relationship with Jesus has changed your life. But as we see here, people are actually seeking inspiration. They're looking for something. They're looking for, for that encouragement. Verse 15 after reading from the Law and the Prophets, the synagogue ruler sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. There is so much unrest and turmoil going on in our world today. People are looking for inspiration. They need a word of encouragement. They are looking for answers to the questions that they don't understand. Why is all this stuff happening? What's happening around me? I don't understand it. See, our God is the best encourager there is. His word to us, the Bible, is full of encouraging, inspiring messages that are meant for us. And here are just a few, and I just want to share these with you. If you need some encouragement this morning. Isaiah 41 and 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 118, 14. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Joshua 1, 9. 
Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm. Be men of courage. Be strong. And Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all you, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I mean, here's the thing. I could stand up here all morning and just read encouraging things out of Scripture. I thought about just sometimes, just for my, my whole sermon time, right? Just standing up here reading Scripture. And you guys would go away as encouraged as if I did this whole sermon, right? Because God's Word is encouraging, and it helps us. And it guides us, and it leads us, and it strengthens us. And the Word of God does bring us encouragement when we need to be encouraged. It brings us motivation when we need to get, be motivated and get moving. It brings us comfort when we are in times of trouble. And the people you are around every day are looking for what the Bible has to offer. They just don't know that until they hear it. They don't know that, and they don't understand it. How God's work can be encouraging until they know and put trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And you, and myself included, are the instruments that God uses to spread the encouragement of his word to the people that need it. Just like Paul and Barnabas, we too are on mission. Verse 16. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers... He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt, and with mighty power, he led them out of the country. He endured their conduct for about 40 years in the desert. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan and gave the land to his people as an inheritance. So what we see here is that Paul gives the people in the synagogue a little refresher course, okay? This is what's happening here, a little refresher course. He, they kind of know all this stuff. They've heard it. They know the, the stories about everything that Paul's telling them, but this is just a little refresher. Let me, let me remind you, basically, is what he's saying. And he's starting with what he knows, right? He, he knows the scriptures. He, he's been a student of the scriptures for, for his entire life. The Bible tells us that Paul was on, well on his way to become a member of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, and that he himself, before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, considered himself to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Now, what I've noticed here. And I want you guys to notice as we go along in Acts. What I've noticed here, and I put a little bit of studying into, is that when Paul is preaching to a Jewish crowd, he, he begins with what Jewish people know. That is, he begins with their history and how God has dealt with them throughout history. He begins with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and here he, he starts with the captivity in Egypt and the exodus out of Egypt. And then when Paul preached to a Gentile crowd... Paul usually began with creation because since the beginning of time, people knew that a divine being created everything in the world, or at least people believed that until about 160 years ago. That's when Charles Darwin published his book on the origin of species and gave us the theory of evolution. And since then, with evolution, natural selection, the Big Bang, it's taken God out of the equation. And so many people believe that we are not created by God. But we are just an accident that happened. We evolved over millions and millions of years. Some kind of ooze turned into intelligent beings millions of years later. So for us, think about it. For us, that entry point into sharing Jesus with some people is really not an option for us today. So we do like Paul does here. He begins his sermon with what he knows. He reminds the people sitting in the synagogue that day, he says, I want you guys to remember, God is good. God is good, right? All the time. All the time, God is good. That's right. 
Verse 17, the God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt with the mighty power. He led them out of the country. He endured their conduct for 40 years in the desert. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan and gave the land to his people as an inheritance. Paul reminds them that God made Israel prosper when they were in Egypt and when they, when they went out as slaves, it was God who did it. With his great power, God led them out of there. And then as they're traveling to the land of promise, I love this. Paul says he endured, he endured Israel's conduct for about 40 years in the desert. The SV translation simply says he put up with them. He did. He put up with them, right? And, and, and so basically what Paul is saying is that even though Israel rebelled time and time again, God gave them mercy. He gave them grace. Aren't you get, glad our God is a God of mercy and grace? Yes, because mercy, God's mercy is holding back from us what we are due, right? He gives us mercy. He doesn't give us what we deserve. And for Israel and for us, he holds back that things that we truly deserve, which is punishment because of our sinful ways and because we sin against a holy and righteous God. We deserve that. We deserve death. We deserve eternal spiritual death. But God is merciful and he holds that back. And then there's grace. Grace is, is giving some, someone something that they don't deserve. Right? God is a God of grace because not only does he give us all good things. Think about this. Not only does he give us all good things like a beautiful earth and beautiful scenery and beautiful mountains and clouds and sun and rain and air. But he's, he's given us the free gift of salvation as well. And Paul said it, and I will say it this morning, that God is good all the time. And then we see here that Paul goes on to telling them, after he reminds them, hey, look, God is good. He says, the promise to David has been fulfilled. Verse 21. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who'd ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. Now, as we read this part right here, this may not mean much to us today. But for those men in the attendance of the, that day in the synagogue, this was big news. This was earth-shattering news to them. For about a thousand years, the people of Israel had been waiting for the one to sit on the throne of, their, of Israel's greatest king, King David. The Jewish people had been expecting for uh, generations for the Messiah of God to come and be that king. The promise or the covenant comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7 where God through the prophet Nathan tells King David that I will raise up your offspring to succeed you and you will come from your own body. I will establish your kingdom. He is the one who will build my house for my name and I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. God promised David that. Look, David, one of your descendants is going to be king, an eternal king. I promise you that. Paul stands up and says, that king is Jesus. For the people there that day, this is news they were not expecting to hear because for over 400 years, Israel had not had a king. And now Paul's telling them that not only has their king arrived, but he is the long-awaited Messiah, and his name is Jesus. And from there, Paul continues to explain the truth concerning Jesus is revealed. The truth concerning Jesus is revealed. The king that all the Jewish people have been waiting for is Jesus, Paul says. That's the truth. And it's the truth because the prophet of Israel has declared that. John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet, prepared the way for the true king of Israel. He came preaching repentance and baptism so the people would be ready when their king arrived. And since he's a prophet of God, John the Baptist gave the truth concerning Jesus. Now, that truth was Jesus is the king, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus, John the Baptist said, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when John the Baptist proclaimed that truth, many believed him because, after all, he's a prophet of God and the people respected him. And even the scripture tells us that Herod knew that the people held John the Baptist in high esteem. And these people here in the synagogue, I believe, also trusted the witness of Paul and the prophet John the Baptist. 
And this is where for us today, people are still believing in the truth concerning Jesus. That's why our mission is so important. The truth of Jesus still exists and people are still believing it because we see it every day because God is saving people and lives are being changed. Because there's a day coming when the question of the truth about Jesus will be asked of you. What do you believe about Jesus? Many have already answered that question. I've talked to many and I've, I've seen where people say, I believe Jesus was a good man, but he wasn't God. He, he was a good teacher, but he certainly wasn't a savior of the world. I mean, come on, no one can come back to life once they're dead, right? Or, I believe that Jesus was a prophet, nothing more. So, to believe he's the Messiah is foolish. Or some don't believe Jesus existed at all, that he was a made-up myth, a legend that is passed down from one generation to another. I want you to know before we go any further that what you believe and trust about Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, will have eternal consequences. That is why, like Paul, we make an urgent appeal, verse 26. Brothers, children of Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles... It is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they carried out all that had been written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people. This is where the rubber meets the road, guys. This is it. This is where what you believe matters. This is where you have to decide whether Jesus was real or not. And this is where you must decide if Jesus was more than a prophet and a good teacher. This is where all people everywhere need to hear the good news about Jesus because they need to know that through Jesus and only Jesus... The salvation is here. Right? Salvation is here. That's what Paul is saying. That's what we proclaim. Through Jesus Christ, salvation is here. Paul tells the Jewish peoples that day, I've been sent on a mission to tell you that salvation is available to all who put their trust in Jesus. And he tells them that it's very easy to shrug off and say, I can't believe that. It can't be true. It's impossible. But that is just what the scriptures told us would happen. Right? And in condemning Jesus and his words and their actions, they fulfilled what you read in the synagogue every week, Paul says. He says, don't you guys understand what you read in the scriptures is about Jesus? What you read has been fulfilled because you read it every week. And just like Paul reached out to the people that day, I'm reaching out to you if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ or believed the word of God, you must understand that salvation is available to you this morning, like right this very morning. You can be set free from your sin. You begin a new life, a new journey, a new mission, so to speak. Salvation is available and it's free because your redemption has been paid. Redemption, it's been paid. Verse 28 Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. Jesus paid the price in his own life's blood so you can be redeemed, so you can have the forgiveness of sin, and it doesn't cost anyone anything. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Titus 3.5 tells us he saved us not because of righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. Because of his mercy. God's mercy is free. Ephesians 2.8.9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. God's grace is free. The redemption that Jesus provides was without question the most expensive thing known to man. But that doesn't cost us a thing. 
but it cost him a great deal. So don't be like the people that Paul is telling us about. They didn't believe. They didn't think Jesus was their king and their Messiah. They didn't recognize Jesus. They didn't confirm that he was their savior. They didn't know him or want to know him, so they missed him. So for anyone who doesn't know him this morning, then don't miss your savior. Don't miss your savior. This is important stuff. All right? Don't miss him because as we have seen, he is a good God that loves you, that died for you, that has given grace and mercy when grace and mercy is not deserved. I shared with my Sunday morning Bible group a couple weeks ago. You guys probably, I probably told this story before. But when I was a student at Kent State, I, I took a Hebrew class. And most of the other students in there were mainly Jewish kids, okay? Because uh, mom and dad paid for it. And so they had to take the class because they wanted their kids to know their, their Jewish heritage and they wanted to learn the language, the Hebrew language. I took it so I could read the Bible in the original language, but they took it, you know, for that. For the final exam, we got together and we, we studied together in a group. And I knew that this was my only chance to talk to, to these kids here. And I call them kids because they were considerably younger than me. It was my only chance to talk to them about Jesus. And as we studied and was sitting there and, and we got finished studying, we, we was talking a little bit and I took a, a drink of my Diet Coke and got that lump out of my throat, you know. And I asked them, I said, let me just ask you guys something. I said, have you ever truly considered that Jesus is your Messiah? One of the guys said, stop right there. I've heard enough. He, he's like, he gets up, he's like, I don't know why this is about all you Christians, you try to convert us. And he gets up and he leaves. Some of the other ones just sat there kind of silently. And the guy who was our tutor at that point said, you know, he said, just a few months ago, he said, I would have not even thought about that. You know, I wouldn't even considered the fact. But he said, recently, you're the second person who's asked me that question. So I don't know if Jesus could be or is our Messiah or not. So I opened up my Bible on my phone and I read, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before his shears was silent. So he did not open his mouth. And I read that and then I asked him, who's this talking about? They said, well, talking about your Jesus because it's in your Bible. I said, this is in your Bible too. This is from Isaiah chapter 53 that was written 700 years before Jesus even was born. Silence. Then one girl said, see, you don't understand. We've had many false messiahs. How can we know Jesus is the real one? How can we know for sure? I'm like, wow, that's a question to be put on the spot, right? I said, well, it's all about faith, right? It's, it's all about trusting in your heart and believing in your soul that Jesus is who he says he is and that you believe with the Bible, it says he did what he says he's done. And I truly believe, I told her, I said, if you're willing wanting to know, God will reveal that to you. And I said, you never know. I said, this might be that revelation. And I concluded with this. And I talked to them as friends, just like I'm talking to you this morning. I told her the first time Jesus came, your people missed him. But the second time he comes, there will be no doubt about who he is because he will come with glory and with power and everyone will know that Jesus is king. So members of Calvary, I just want to tell you, Jesus is coming back with glory and with power. We have a mission to the world and our nation and our community. And when he does return, let us be found doing the mission that he has given us to do. If you're here this morning and you have never placed your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can do that this morning as we sing a closing song. Salvation is here. Don't miss your Savior. 
the Spirit of God has spoken to your hearts this morning. I'll be up front here to help lead you into that new relationship or answer any question you may have. Let's pray.